All right, a very good morning to everyone. Welcome to NPARC Spotlight. Thank you for joining us today. And for those that have attended our previous talks, welcome back. Today's is the third in our series, and we will be focusing on the treasures beneath our tides. My name is Leslie. I'm from the National Biodiversity Centre at the National Parks Board. This series aims to introduce and develop a deeper understanding about our local biodiversity. If you missed our first two talks, you can find the recordings on the NPARCS SG YouTube channel. Our July sessions have also been open for registration. Some of us here might be avid nature lovers and would be familiar with some of the species and habitats covered. But our hope is that through these talks, you continue to be surprised and learn even more about the biodiversity that we are so lucky to share our little red dots with. This myriad of habitats and species are precious and there is a plan that guides us to protect our biodiversity. And this is the Nature Conservation Master Plan. For those of you who are keen to hear more, do go and listen to the introduction of our first talk, The Creatures of the Night, which is available on our YouTube channel. In it, the group director of NBC, Lim Liang Jim, outlines the details of this master plan, which underpins our collective effort to conserve our biodiversity. The link will also be shared with you in the chat. But right now, Let's dive into today's topic, the fascinating lives of our intertidal creatures. I'm very excited to welcome Chiu Pei Rong, Senior Manager of the National Biodiversity Center. She launched our very own intertidal watch program and is passionate about conserving the treasures beneath our tides. If during the presentation, you have any questions for Pei Rong, do send them to me, Leslie, as a private message using the Zoom chat. All right, without further ado, take it away, Peirong. All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining this Saturday morning with us. Today, I'm going to just share with you some, some, some of our intertidal areas and virtually bring you to our shores and explore the intertidal animals and plants that we find in Singapore. But before we do that, let's warm up by exercising our fingers first. So if you could bring out your phones and go to nantimeter.com, or you could just scan the QR code, it will bring you to a page. Just give you a few more seconds. All right. So use a word to describe what intertidal means to you. I think I see the word marine. Crabs, corals, shoreline, shallow waters, beach, spring tide, middle, waves, between, interesting, animals of the sea, reefs, full of life, biodiverse, sea creatures, seagrass, spring tide shoreline, the sea. Oh, I saw my name as well. <laughs> Horseshoe crabs. Fun. So for those who just join us, you could go to menti.com and type and use the code 811105 to enter.
inaccessible animals, sea cucumbers, varying water levels, amazing octopus, mudflat. Precious. Wow, it looks like most of you have, have entered the word. And please keep it going. All right, so what exactly is intertidal area? Intertidal refers to the coastal zone between the highest high tide and the lowest low tide mark. It's the area that's exposed during low tide. And it is home to a variety of different marine life. Some of the intertidal habitats in Singapore include our rocky shores, our sandy beaches, and our seagrass meadows. And because when the tide is high, the animals are submerged in water, and when the tide is low, the animals get exposed. So this makes intertidal areas one of the most stressful environments to live in. And because of that, the animals have adopted coping mechanisms to survive the harsh conditions. So today, I'm just going to share with you some of the intertidal areas that we have in Singapore, different habitats, and the marine life that live on these areas. So this is um, the intertidal reef and rubble. And we do have intertidal reefs and rubble on the shores of Singapore. And some of them are mostly in the Southern Islands. And there we find corals, anemones, and lots of interesting fishes, as well as marine life. And this is a giant clam. So there are people used to, people often think that the giant clams are actually man eaters. So they would trap you underwater and hold on to your legs when the clams close. However, that's, that's just a myth. In fact, giant clams do, have never killed anyone before. So this is one of the giant clams that we spotted in, in our southern islands. And then you see this fleshy area over here is actually called the mantle. So the mantle is colorful because it has photosynthetic organisms called zooxanthellae that lives inside of it. And it helps to photosynthesize and provide some food for the giant clams. Giant clams are also very important food sources for other animals, such as fishes, predatory snails, sea stars, crabs, octopuses, and more. And they also provide shelter for other animals. And they are also very important in our reefs because they, the, their calcium carbonate shells help to build and shape our reefs. And this is another animal that sometimes we see on our shores during low tide. This is the nudibranch, the polka dot nudibranch. So the nudibranch is thought to feed on sponges and they're called nudibranch because of their naked gills. So this is, this is the naked gills of the nudibranch and that's how they breathe with their external gills on their back. We also find sharks living in our waters. Sharks are important apex predators in the food chain. This one here that you see is the black dip reef shark and it's often a very delightful find to see them on our shores. So when you see animals that are brightly colored, it often means that they're either poisonous or venomous. This one, this animal over here is the mosaic reef crab and it is poisonous. So please do not eat them because even if you cook them, the toxins are not destroyed by cooking. And the toxins are similar to the neurotoxins of pufferfish. We also have mangroves in Singapore and in areas like Sungai Bulo Wetland Reserve. Pulau Tekong, Pulau Ubin, Pulau Sumaka, and Pasiris Park. 
in our mangroves, we can find the giant mud skippers and many other animals. This is one of our last remaining natural rocky shores in Singapore at Labrador Nature Reserve. And in the rocky shores, these are some of the animals that we often see. We find barnacles attached to the, to the rocks, we find crabs, and lots of animals with shells, the marine snails. And this particular part over here, it's called an apoculum. So the apoculum is, acts like a trap door for the snails, trapping the moisture in and also preventing animals, the predators, from getting inside. Do you see anything interesting in this photo? This is the stonefish and it really looks like a stone. The dorsal fin, which is the fin on its back over here, has got spines that can penetrate the soles of your shoe. Like hypodermic needles, they inject venom and neurotoxins into your, into your foot. But these spines in these animals are for self-defense and they don't use it for hunting. So stonefish are venomous. One of the other habitats that we find in our intertidal areas is the mud flats. This photo was taken at Chek Jawa. And sandy, our sandy beaches are also filled with life. So if you spot these bumps on the shore, on the sand, these are actually animals. They're called sand dollars. So sand dollars are a group of animals, belong to this group called echinoderms, which means spiny skin. So if you can see, they have a five-sided symmetry, one, two, three, four, five. And the mouth of the sand dollar is on the underside, right at the center. So sand dollars feed on detritus, tiny little animals, and tiny little organic matter that they find in the sand. And some people ask me why they're called sand dollars. So because when the animal, when the sand dollar dies, it loses these um, little tiny spines. And when the, and it leaves this thing called a test. And when the test is bleached by the sun, it looks really like a large silver coin, looking like a, like a dollar. And on our shores, I'm sure some of you might have spotted this. Lots of burrows and holes uh, on our high shore, in our beaches. These are made by this particular animal here called the ghost crab. They're called the ghost crab because they run really fast. So one minute you see them, the next moment they're gone. So what you see here is the adult ghost crab. And these are the juvenile ghost crabs, the baby ones. So the juvenile ghost crabs resemble the background. Um, they match a background. So this is called uh, camouflage and background matching. And we also found that there is a day there's a clear daily rhythm of color change. So when it's in the day, they become lighter in color. And when it's at night, they become darker in color. So this helps to improve the camouflage to the sand that they live on. And over here, we've got another crab. This is the fiddler crab. And this one over here is a male fiddler crab because it has one larger and large pincer. So the males would use its, use its enlarged pincer to attract the females by waving at them, saying, come here, come here. And on the other hand, the females have two smaller, two smaller pincers, and which is why they feed better and faster. And this animal over here is the horseshoe crab. We have two species of horseshoe crabs in Singapore, the coastal horseshoe crab, and the mangrove horseshoe crab. So this one over here is the coastal horseshoe crab. So horseshoe crabs are very interesting because they have the color of their blood is blue in color. This is because it's copper based instead of iron. And the blood in horseshoe crab is used to test for bacteria toxins in drugs. Scientists have also cloned that compound so you no longer need to use the blood for the horseshoe crab um, to test for bacteria toxins in drugs. And sometimes we spot horseshoe crabs in pairs. 
So this this one is actually uh, innating pairs, and it's called in they are called in amplexus. So the male, which is smaller than the female, is the one on top. And now we move on to the seagrass meadows, one of my favorite habitats. In the seagrass meadows, we see lots of different species of seagrass. And this is a spoon seagrass. This is needle seagrass. This is fern seagrass. And seagrass are plants, which is why they have flowers. This, this, you see flowers of the tape seagrass here. And in our seagrass habitat, there are lots and lots of animals living there. And this one particular here is the moon, the ball moon snail. And you can see that sometimes the moon snail burrows into the sand to keep itself moist. And they also look for food. So moon snails are predatory. They are carnivorous. So the moon snail lay their eggs in, mm, in these masses called the sand collar, mixing their eggs with the sand and the mucus forming this particular structure. So if you do see them on our shores when you explore the shore, try not to pick them up because the eggs might be in there. And this other snail over here is called the cowrie. So cowries. Cowries have very shiny shells because the mantle, which is the flesh around it, will envelope its shells to prevent the algae and encrusting animals from attaching and settling on the shell. They eat algae, sponges, and some of them are carnivorous. And one interesting thing about the cowries is that they used to be used as a currency in different parts of the world, such as in Asia, Africa, Oceania, and in some places in Europe. So people use them as a form of currency, like money. And this animal over here, also burrowing, it's a, an olive snail. Olive snails are predators as well. They feed on other snails, small little crabs, crustaceans, and they are scavengers too. So they look for dead animals that they can feed on. And some animals don't live alone. So right here, you see the olive whelk, also another snail. So this is the whelk. And you also see the snail hitching anemone that's attached to the olive whelk. So the snails gain some form of a little bit of protection by the anemones because the anemones have stinging cells. And the anemones benefit perhaps by having better access to food. And this beautiful animal over here, it's a noble volute, and it's also a carnivorous marine snail. And this, this animal here, it's a, an orange striped hermit crab, and you can see it has used the shell of a noble volute as its home. So there are many animals that, um, well, it's not good to pick up shells on the beaches because these shells provide a home to animals such as hermit crabs. So this is another hermit crab as well. So if you do visit the shore, as much as it is tempting to, to pick up the shells, try not to do it because it might deprive some of these hermit crabs from, from finding its home. And when the hermit crab grows bigger, it has to change to a bigger shell in order uh, to live in it. And the hermit crab will die if it doesn't have a shell as well. And on our shores, especially in our, in our northern shores, we have a beautiful diversity of echinoderms that I mentioned earlier. So this is a relative of the sand dollars that we talk about. These are the sea stars. So this is a, this is a sand star. And this one here is a common sea star. But while its name it suggests that it might be common, it's no longer as common as in the past. And this one here is a, it's a biscuit sea star. And these are, the, are very charismatic, knobbly sea star. And some people call it the chocolate chip sea star because it looks like it has chocolate chips on top on, on it. 
and now these sea stars are, are really interesting because if you see the different pictures over here, all of them look very, very different. So the orientation and the size and the colors of the knots and its arrangement is a little bit like our fingerprints because every individual is different. So it has different arrangement of knots, different colors as well. So there was a study that looked at the different arrangement of, of the knobbly sea stars and they found that you can actually tell them, tell the individuals apart. And at MPAX, we have also done a study um, with knobbly sea stars where we found that using agent-based modeling, we found that the populations that we have in the north and the populations that, that we have in the south of Singapore is actually connected via stepping stones of uh, intertidal habitats in between. So this, this shows that these connecting stepping stones are important for the connectivity for the two populations in the north and in the south. While sea stars often have five arms, not all of them have always have five arms. There are, there are sea stars with more than five arms. And in fact, if a sea star loses one of its arms, it can actually grow back its arms again. And this one over here is an eight arm sea star. So it has eight arms and we often spot it on some of our intertidal trips. So another relative of the sea star is this particular animal here called the brittle stars. So you can see it also has five arms, but the five arms are long and they're actually connected to this particular round thing. It's called their, their central disc. So brittle sea stars, as its name suggests, they have very brittle arms. So, if, so when they're threatened, they can actually drop an arm away to confuse or distract the predators while it allows them to run away. And this interesting looking animal over here, also a relative of our sea stars and, and is the basket star. So these basket stars are normally found in the deep, more in deeper waters, but sometimes we do encounter them on our intertidal areas. Basket stars are really interesting because they have highly branched and fleshy arms. That's why it looks like a basket. That's why it's called a basket star. And they feed on microscopic organisms called zooplankton by forming a basket to catch their prey and then transporting it into the central disc at this middle part here, which is where their mouth is on the underside. And another animal over here, also a relative of the sea stars, basket stars, ten dollars. This is a feather star. It's also known as a crinoid, which actually means lily-like. So feather stars are filter feeders, and they also do have pretty brittle arms. And sometimes animals get washed up on our shore because of the waves. And this basket star over here is actually trying to make its way back into the sea. Still at echinoderms, the, this, these animals over here are all sea urchins. So sea urchins are relatives of sea stars, sand dollars, and basket stars, and, and feather stars as well. And this is the underside of the, of the, sea, uh, of the white salmacy sea urchin. So if you look at this part over here, you can actually see the circle of five plates forming a big like structure. So this area is called, uh, this part here is called the Aristotle's lantern. So that's how the sea, the sea urchins feed and they usually graze on seaweed. Another relative of the sea stars are the sea cucumbers. The sea cucumbers are also echinoderms. And this one over here is the sandfish sea cucumber, or some people call it the garlic bread sea cucumber because it looks a little bit like a garlic bread. And this one over here, it looks really brightly colored. 
this is our sea apple sea cucumbers. So because it's so, so colorful, people often find it really interesting and they don't know what they are. But these are actually sea cucumbers. And sea cucumbers comes in different colors, shapes and sizes. This one over here is the pink warty sea cucumber. And this over here is the thorny sea cucumber. And both of them are actually quite common on our shores. And this is the thorny sea cucumber with its feeding tentacles. So sea cucumber, uh, this species of sea cucumber, is a, they are suspension feeders. What it means is they feed on the plankton and the tiny little animals in the water. So what it does is they use the feeding tentacles and they just reach it out in the water. And then they would pull the fit they pull one thing, uh, feeding tentacle each into their mouth as they feed on the, anim uh, the little tiny plankton that they have caught in their, in their feeding tentacles. And now one of my favorite animals that we see on our intertidal area, the octopus. So octopuses belong to this group of animals called the cephalopods. And cephalopods means head foot. And they are very, very intelligent animals with excellent eyesight and a very well-developed brain by invertebrate standards. Invertebrates are animals without backbone. So you can see this octopus over here. It's so, so well camouflaged and it moves really nicely on the intertidal area. And sometimes if it's not moving, it's really hard to spot them. And this octopus over here is actually trying to hide from us. So it was attempting to move this little, uh, big rubble and rock and it couldn't move. So it was actually reaching out to the tiny little rocks around it, hoping to grab some of them to hide itself. So octopuses are really intelligent because they have a well-developed brain and they have they're really good with learning as well, and they have some form of a memory storage as well, and they have very good eyesight. So because it was too big for, for it to be moved, the rock, so it decided to move on to smaller ones. And then look, it's hiding itself now, much better now. And sometimes they're also really quite cute because they would hide amongst shells, thinking that we wouldn't see them because uh, it's really well camouflaged, I have to say. And this particular octopus here that we spotted during one of our intertidal surveys, we're really excited to see it and we're wondering why it, doesn't, it didn't choose to hide or run away. So it was actually trying to display to us. And then after that, we found out that it's because she has eggs that she had laid in this last bottle just over here. So mother octopuses will look after their eggs and keep them um, well oxygenated, make sure that the eggs have enough oxygen and they also defend them from predators. And because they don't usually feed when they're tending and looking after their eggs, so they usually die after their eggs hatch. A relative of the octopus is the cuttlefish, also a cephalopod. So this cuttlefish here was spotted um, during one of our bio blitz that we have at Changi Beach. And at Changi Beach, we have actually set up enhan coastal enhancement units to help to enhance our sea walls. So this was one of um, the animals that we spotted. And cuttlefish are also very, very exciting. So you can see that their colors are changing. So cuttlefish, like the octopus, have these cells um, with pigments. They are called chromatophores. So the dispersion and concentration of the chromatophores on their body helps them to change their colors. And they also, these, um, they also have sometimes changed the texture to make themselves look very, very well camouflaged. So the octopuses and the cuttlefish, they're, they're masters of camouflage. And over here, we see the seahorse. 
So sometimes we do find seahorses resting on our shores. They're not dead here. They're just uh, resting in little water puddles. So sometimes when the tide recedes and when the tide is low, they, they get, um, we spot them in these tiny puddles, but they're all still alive. And when the tide comes back up, and they'll be back in the water again. So they're actually okay. And seahorses, and if, and if we do spot them a little bit too dry, we'll move some water to them, or we'll, we'll try to, to make sure that they're okay. And one interesting fact about seahorse that is the males that get pregnant. So we call them the, the pregnant papas. So seahorses, uh, what happens is when the, the females will lay their eggs into the pouches of the males. So you can see that the males usually have bigger pouches than the females. And as they lay their eggs inside, the males fertilize the eggs. And then the little baby seahorses will develop in their pouch and when they're ready to emerge they would then emerge from the male seahorse's pouch it's very interesting another animal also where the males carry the eggs is also a relative of the seahorse is the pipefish so here we see a seagrass pipefish and some sometimes animals don't live alone they live together and here you spot, here you can see anemone shrimps living on this animal here called the carpet anemone. So this is the peacock tail anemone shrimp. And this one over here, this animal here is a sea pen. It's a spiky sea pen. And sea pens are relatives of corals anemones, and jellyfish, so they are cnidarians. So hiding in this sea pen over here is a porcelain crab. So you might wonder, why, why do we explore the shores and, and all these photos and videos that you've seen earlier are all taken on, on Singapore shores during low tide? So this is because we have this program called Intertidal Watch. And I'll let my volunteers see what happens. It is now 6 a.m. We are gearing up while waiting for low tide before we start our Intertidal Watch survey. Intertidal Watch is a citizen science program where volunteers like us actually take part to conduct surveys at low tide areas along our to monitor the marine biodiversity and then the data is actually collected by NPARCS for research and conservation purpose. So in a team of five, uh, we'll observe and see what are the marine habitats that around the area. And then within each group, there will be one data recorder, seekers and one photographer. So my father takes pictures of our sightings and he's usually the frame guy who will decide out the sample area that we'll be surveying. He does everything except for recording on the data sheet because we cannot read his handwriting. I actually identify them and then record them into the data sheet. Phoebe, she's quite good at spotting the different species. Yeah, she's sharp enough to spot them. We were actually set up in different tidal zones from low, medium, high and then within each of the zone, each of the team will actually lay out the transact tape of 25 meters and then we will actually set up five different quadrants. Based on the computer generated data points, we will go out and uh, place the quadrants based on those points, then we will monitor the marine life there. Although Singapore is an urban city state, we realise that there's a lot of uh, nature around us. Through this intertidal watch, we realise that we can raise the awareness on the marine biodiversity as well as promote conservation uh, in our Singapore shores. During our intertidal watch surveys, we get to see a diversity of marine life. So there are some creatures that we usually see, which is the sea urchin and the sea cucumber. My husband is a nature lover, so we wanted to do something meaningful together as a family. Plus, I wanted uh, Phoebe to move away from the mobile devices to appreciate the nature in Singapore. Through this program, it's definitely a very good experience for the family 
And now because of this program, I mean Phoebe is now definitely more aware of the nature around her. So now she's actually part of the school science club. I've learned about the impact of trash on marine life. Once we tried to untangle a crab from a fishing net, it's during such encounters when you realise how fragile marine life is. Therefore, we need to do everything we can to conserve every single bit of our marine life. So as you have heard in the video, uh, Intertidal Watch is a citizen science program and the main objective is to document and monitor the biodiversity and of our intertidal areas. But we need to know what we have on our shores before we can protect them. And the tagline here is you don't have to be a scientist to do science and anyone and everyone can do it. So we've had about more than 500 volunteers that have participated in Intertidal Watch so far since 2016. And all of them come from different walks of life. So we use the information that we collect from our surveys to inform our decisions and our management conservation actions in Singapore. So at MParks, we strongly believe in supporting our decision and management actions with science and data. So the volunteers also share what they have learned with other people at our public events. So here you see volunteers teaching other people how to do a survey and sharing with them some of the marine life that we have spotted during our surveys. And they also share them at guided walks as well. And here's an app that you can download if you would like to help out. So this is the app called SG Bio Atlas. And I think it's, a, it's, a, it's available on the App Store and on Google Play. And you can even join our project, our project called Intertidal Sightings, where you can take photographs of the intertidal animals and you can upload them onto SG Bio Atlas. So this is also a form of citizen science where we collect, we are able to collect your sightings that so we know what animals are found at which locations. And the SG Bio Atlas app also has very interesting uh, animal guides. There are bird guides, um, insects, amphibians as well. And it's really important that um, Sir David Attenborough said that no one will protect what they don't care about and no one will care about what they've never experienced. So we hope that through Intertidal Watch, we can connect people with nature and so that they will know what we have and they will want to protect what we have. So before we end, let me just ask you this specific question. And you can think about how you would like to play a part in helping to conserve our nature, biodiversity, and our marine life in our city, in nature. So if you could scan this code again and go to menti.com. It's the same one as the one earlier. And I'll move to So now the question is, after listening to the talk, use a word to describe what intertidal means to you now. So if you could scan the code or use the code 8111105. I see biodiversity, conservation, beautiful, rich, treasures, biscuit sea star, habitat, octopus, coal, cherished, fun, life and nature, protection, colorful, treasures. Living between tides, interesting, cherished.
Oh, someone said, wow. Habitat. Amazing. Low tide. Fun. Animals and us. Priceless. Nature. Our world. All right. And with that, thank you very much for being with us today. And I hope that you can join us in conserving our marine life. And if you do have any questions, you can drop me an email at, at my email address over here. And this is also a photo taken during one of our intertidal surveys. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, Pei for sharing with us about the very colourful world beneath our tides and also telling us more about how we as individuals can contribute. So either by joining the Intertidal Watch program or sharing our sightings on SG Bioatlas. Now, if you're interested to find out more about these, the links have been shared in the Zoom chat. Okay, so we will proceed with our Q&A. Thank you to all of those who submitted questions. Now, do note that in, in the interest of time, we will, not, we will not be able to go through all of them, but we'll try to cover as many as we can. So the first question, what should I take note of when I visit the intertidal area? So I think the most important thing is safety. So I think the main thing is, number one, you have to check the tides. So in Singapore, we have two high tides and two low tides each day. But usually, I would go down to the intertidal area during the spring low tide, which are the very, very, very low tides. So you can check the tide um, using the N, uh, by going to the NEA website. You can just search for tide table NEA or tide timings NEA, and that's where you can find the low tide. So it's also very important. Uh, safety is very important because some areas are, are a little bit more dangerous, and sometimes the tides can come in very quickly. So make sure you know the tides very well before you head down. And the second thing is because the intertidal areas is really rich in life. So for safety reasons, you saw you heard about the stonefish earlier, right? It has spines that can pierce through the sole of your of your shoes. So make sure you wear covered shoes when you head out, and preferably um, long uh, trousers. Where, and you tuck your trousers into your shoes because there are sting animals in on our intertidal area. And also do not wear your stepping because the intertidal area is filled with life and we don't want to be stepping on some of these animals like the anemones, like the sand dollars, or the sea cucumbers. So it's very important. And, if, and try not to bring too big a group to the intertidal area because our intertidal area is also quite sensitive to trampling. So we, this is the reason why I often keep my surveys for intertidal watch at about 15 people. So we don't want to love our shores and then end up trampling on them. So we have to manage that impact while we visit our nature areas. All right. So I guess, you know, we have to do our homework, you know, not just checking the tight timings, but also know how we can be suitably prepared when we venture out into the intertidal area. And of course, while we are there, it's also important to be mindful, you know, don't step on things unknowingly. All right. Let's see the next question. Where can seagrass meadows be found in Singapore? Uh, so seagrass meadows are, are found in a number of places in Singapore, both on the mainland as well as in our islands offshore. So on the mainland, the areas that I often go to are Changi Beach, East Coast Park, Coney Island, and Pasir Ris Park. So these are some of the mainland areas that we have uh, seagrasses. And on the offshore islands, uh, you can find them at Chek Jawa, at Pulau Ubin. And I've also seen them at, um, at Pulau Semakau, at Sisters Islands Marine Park, at St. John's Islands as well. So most of, some of our southern islands also do have seagrass areas. Okay, so there's a variety of locations in Singapore, both on the mainland and offshore, where we can find seagrass meadows. I'm sure they're also all rich in life. So the next question is, what is N Parks doing to help conserve our marine life? Uh, so at N Parks, um, one of 
One of our focus is also to ensure the conservation of our marine, coastal marine habitats and biodiversity. So at NPAS, we have our nature conservation master plan that Leslie has shared earlier. And on top of that, we have our marine conservation action plan. So I can give a whole lecture on it, but I'm just going to keep it very brief. So in the marine conservation action plan, we have four thrusts. The first one is conservation of our key habitats. So our key habitats are our Sisters Islands Marine Park, our Labrador Nature Reserve, which has our rocky shore, and then the Sungai Buloh Wetland Reserve. So these are some of our key habitats. We need to conserve and protect these key habitats. And it's not just enough just to conserve what we already have. So what we do, we take a step further and we, do our habit uh, and we go on to enhance our habitats and our biodiversity. So the second stress is our habitat enhancement, restoration and species recovery. So in terms of habitats, we've worked on enhancing mangroves at Pulau Tekong, by planting mangroves at different places. And we also have habitat restoration on our coral reefs where we put in um, reef enhancement units. You might have heard of the JTCM parks and collaboration where we place artificial reefs on, on near our Sisters Islands Marine Park. And in terms of like more looking at species, um, specific uh, conservation efforts. We have species recovery programs for giant clams, for Neptune's cup sponge, and, and corals as well. We have coral nurseries too. And we also have a turtle conservation uh, program where we have a turtle hatchery at our Sister Silence Marine Park. And we also have volunteers patrolling our shores during the turtle nesting period. So this is uh, our beach patrol program that you can find online too. And of course, the science is very important in what we do here at NPARX. So our third trust is our applied research and conservation planning and biology planning, where we, where we work in collaboration with universities and research institutes to, to, look, out, to look at applied research questions that can help to better manage our, our coastal marine environment and biodiversity. So we look at like corals and how, how sediments can affect the corals. And then we look at other, other research questions as well, such as ecotoxicity. And we also have a lot of biodiversity surveys. So what you saw in the Tidal Watch is just one of them. We also have our reef surveys. Our, and we also have this comprehensive marine biodiversity survey that was completed a few years ago, where we documented what we have on our shores. And then we also use a bit more on the technology side of things, where we use population genetics, DNA barcoding and environmental DNA to support our work. And the fourth trust, because it's um, community stewardship and outreach in nature, because we can't do conservation alone, so we need the support and we work very closely together with our stakeholders, other government agencies, as well as with the general public and our community to build public interest and involvement in our biodiversity conservation efforts. So we have the Community in Nature Initiative and the Tidal Watch is part of it. And we also have um, citizen science projects that you, that you heard about earlier. We have the SG Bio Atlas, and we have the Friends of the Marine Park, where we have worked with different stakeholders to, to manage our marine park. So these are some of the things that we do at NParks. All right, so I think uh, Pei Rong shared a, a bit more about the Nature Conservation Master Plan that was mentioned in the introduction. So it's a multifaceted plan and it targets a lot of different habitats and species. So if you are really keen to find out more, I highly recommend you to watch the first, the introduction of our first talk, The Creatures of the Night, on our YouTube channel. So you can find out a bit more about the Nature Conservation Master Plan. Okay, and we'll just take one final question, which is, why do you like to work in the intertidal area? Okay, so I'm a marine biologist, but actually I don't die. So I feel that the intertidal area is an excellent platform and area where we can help to engage the public and to connect people with nature because the marine environment can sometimes seem a bit distant for some people who can't swim or they don't live along the beaches or close to the beaches. But you can actually, and our intertidal areas are actually very accessible. So as long as you can put on a pair of booties or a pair of shoes, you can explore the, our intertidal areas. So people don't actually need to know how to swim or how to dive in order to explore the areas. And the other thing about the intertidal area that's really exciting is you really don't know what you will spot. So for me, it's a little bit like treasure hunting. 
So every time I go down to the intertidal area, I kind of know like what are the, some of the common things that I will see, but I can never expect, um, I can never predict what I will find. So you would have to like search and walk along the intertidal area carefully and then search for this, these little lively gems on our shore. And sometimes you get very, very exciting finds and very exciting sightings. So that's one of the reasons why I, I like work, working in the intertidal area. All right, thank you so much for sharing, Peirong. I think it's very clear that it's, it's something I'm really passionate about. And even today, you know, even, even though you have to go out there so many times, it's, you always find things that can excite you during your, each trip. Yeah. All right, so this brings us to the end of today's NPARC Spotlight. Thank you, Peirong, for that highly engaging presentation. And, to our, and thank you to our audience as well, both on Zoom and YouTube for being with us today. So these are the talks that we have lined up for July. We do have some slots remaining in the Zoom session for 25th July, not just web builders. So if you thought that all spiders build webs, think again. Spiders actually display a variety of hunting strategies, not just building webs. Some are masters of camouflage and some even set traps for their prey. But either way, most spiders are harmless to humans and by joining this talk, you can learn more about how they quietly do their parts for the ecosystem. So do sign up for that, but you can also look out for the live stream of all our talks on the NPARC's SG YouTube channel. The recordings of, the, of our previous talks are there as well. So if you have any feedback about today's talk, do share it with, with us by scanning the QR code on the left. And if you want to join our talks in July, do scan the QR code on the right for details and registration links. Or look out for updates on NPARC's social media channels. The links for all these will also be shared in the Zoom chat. So with that, I'd like to thank Peirong and thank all of you once again for joining us this morning. Have a great weekend. Take care and stay safe. Thank you very much, everyone.